השם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ממש, it's uh, extraordinary to be here, young Israel here in Los Angeles. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's nice to see some familiar faces, it's nice to see some new faces. Um, I was asked to speak about a few topics, one of them being my personal story, but since I'm kind of bored of my own story, because I lived it, so I'll tell you some other stuff too. Uh, but uh, also some other things, some things that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. I believe that, you know, in, a, in most of my life I was in a secular world, and um, I suffered the same dilemma that most people suffer today in the Jewish world, which is that unless you've delved into Torah really seriously, uh, it's very easy to think that the Torah is not relevant to our life today. Uh, I'll give you an example. So, and this is, again, this is not necessarily just from the secular world, this is also from the religious world. You see a lot of people that uh, are just confused today. This is just simply confused. Uh, some of them are confused and secular. They call themselves atheists, they call themselves masotim, they call themselves whatever they want to call themselves. Sometimes they go so far as to the extent of being part of the thousand people a week that convert to Christianity, Hashem Echem. And this is only in Israel I'm talking about. This is not including the U.S., which is much worse numbers. Or they go to the extent of intermarrying, going and marrying into a different religion, and not realizing the consequence that it carries. Uh, because again, if no one tells you, how are you going to know? If no one told you how to do your job, how would you learn it? If no one told you anything, how would you learn it? And trial and error is, is usually the way system we use in our day-to-day -day life but in Judaism and in life, the error is very, very costly. So you could do trial and error, like I did, but the error is very costly. It's very, very expensive. Because sometimes you find out the error when you're already 60, 70, 80, and, or you've already invested an enormous amount of time, effort, money, and so on into it, that by the time you realize you've made an error, it's so difficult, almost impossible to undo it. So my job has been since I left Wall Street and have decided to spend Baruch Hashem the rest of my life uh, in this world at least trying to get Amisad back to Hashem is to tell people what uh, apparently some other people don't want to do or no one did it doesn't really make a difference really is so to save people from having the same dilemma that I did because my dilemma was very very expensive not just in money but in life and in pain so the Jewish world today, Chabot, Chabot, have a seat right here. Yeah, have a seat. The Jewish world today is very confused, and this is not just coming from the secular world where you see a person doesn't know if God exists, and you could prove to him that God exists scientifically, whether it's through psukim in the Torah or scientific knowledge, uh, different things in the Torah that are just truly extraordinary. Uh, for example, you could see uh, we have a three-part movie series that uh, Hashem, one of your amazing members, Albert, has helped us produce. It's a Torah and science and uh, ancient wisdom. Showing how you could literally prove God in this Torah uh, scientifically. Uh, and uh, this is a, has been a very, very successful uh, movie series, very similar to the one that Rav Mizrahi Sheikh has, uh, has done over the years, uh, but just with some other new things uh, that perhaps weren't mentioned there or mentioned in a different way. Point being is that you can prove God scientifically. You can prove the Torah scientifically. It's not just rationally. It's not just logically. You can prove it scientifically. For some people, this works. For some people, it doesn't. For some people, it's just not enough. And those some people are not always secular. Those some people are sometimes very religious. Sometimes they wear a kippah. Sometimes they have a beard longer than mine. A beard is free, by the way. Even the goat has it. But the reality, you know, beard doesn't make you religious. That's why Hashem gave it to the goats. <laughs> so, the reality is, is that sometimes they have a beard, sometimes they have a hat, sometimes they look more religious than anybody in this room. But sometimes they don't have an ounce of emunah. Emunah is something you only carry through a combination of learning from books as well as experience. And by experience, I mean hard experience. Not the experience of going to the park and enjoying yourself. 
you know, looking at the wind, you know, at the sun and the wind, and your kids run. No, that's not experience. Experience means life experience, difficulty, nightmare, whatever you want to call it. The reality is that's experience. When someone asks you, do you have experience? They're not really asking if you worked for uh, A&E for the last 20 years or if you worked for Discovery Channel, if you worked for, you know, Pfizer or Coca-Cola. They're asking you, have you gone through hell and back? And can you know, do you know what to do by now? If you do, we want to hire you. If you don't, we need somebody else. It's cheaper. And we'll teach them. So this experience is costly, but it's valuable. But sometimes people don't want to learn. So for example, I'll give you a life story, real story, that happened to me this Shabbat. After we left Beknesset, I'm staying at my brother's house. And uh, outside of the Beknesset, uh, I was waiting for my brother to come out. He was talking to a few people. And a religious guy came up to me. And uh, he says, oh, I'm sorry, I haven't been able to come to the lectures this past week. He had a lecture every day, but, you know, I wasn't able to come. I'm sorry, so on and so forth. By the way, is the red, blue light on? On the microphone? Yeah. The microphone's on? Yeah. yeah. Right. That'd be terrible to have the whole lecture and there's no, no sound. <laughs> <laughs> That's happened to me a few times. So he asked me, he's like, oh, I'm sorry, I missed the lecture. So I, really, I really wanted to talk to you. I really want to talk to you. And I said, sure, well, what about? He goes, well, you know, it's kind of like business-related, so it's kind of Shabbat, but you know what? Shabbat Kodesh, Shabbat Kodesh. This is what he tells me. Ah, for Shabbat, we'll talk about it. So I'm thinking he's going to ask me about some halakha, you're allowed to do this, you're allowed to do that. I don't know, something. He's telling me it's Shabbat, and he knows, he's religious, he knows you're not allowed to talk business on Shabbat. Right? So, so far, we're on the same page. He says... And by the way, the stock market, I'm thinking about investing into the stock market. And since you have experience in the stock market, I don't know who to trust because everybody says the same disclosure. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. And he starts talking about the stock market. <laughs> this is 100% business on Shabbat from a religious guy. Now, I could do two things. I could tell him no business on Shabbat. But that's not really going to help him. Why is it not going to help him? Because he already knows no business on Shabbat. He's religious. He's a beard. He's got a hat. He's got everything. The goat was jealous already of the beard. <laughs> but he knows. But he says for Shabbat Kodesh. We're going to talk business for Shabbat Kodesh. Meaning we're so confused. We don't even know what Shabbat is. So the second option was the following. I asked him. Well, actually, I first told him. You know, there's a story by the Chafetz Chaim. Chafetz Chaim, Allah wa Shalom, was Kodesh Kodeshim. And someone came to him with the same exact question. And he said to him, Kvod Arav, I'm looking to make more parnasa, so I'm going to start a new business. What do you think? He says, okay, so you want to make more parnasa, kid. So why do you want to start a new business? So he repeats the same thing. He says, no, Kvod Arav, I want to make more money, so I'm starting a new business. What do you think? He says, okay, fine, so you want to make more money. So why are you starting a new business? He says, no, no, you don't know, understand. The business is to make more money, so I, that's why I'm starting the business. He says, I don't understand. Why do you think you're going to make more money if you start a new business? What is it like? It's like somebody that has a barrel of wine, and he says, I want to make more money, so he just makes a second opening to the same barrel. At the end of the month, how much does he have? The same exact thing, it just has two openings. So he thinks foolishly, you know what? If the second opening is not working, what am I going to do? I'm going to have a third opening. At, at the end of the month, what happens? The same exact one. He says, the vessels remain the same. What makes you think that another business, another real estate investment, another anything is going to make you more money? It's coming from the same place. He says, don't you have to do ishtadlut? He says, yes, but what makes you think that opening another business is that ishtadlut? So the guy says to me, looks to me, you know, and he's confused a little bit. He says, yeah, these are really nice stories, but in today's age... It's very difficult to believe them. And I said to him, well, since the easy way didn't work, so I have to go a little harder. I have to step it up a little bit. <laughs> so I said, well, listen, you know, the thing is, though, you're right. It's very hard to believe them. But just to let you know, if you don't believe such stories, that Parnassai is from Shemaim, you're considered 100% a heretic. You're considered 100% a kufir, gamu. Why? You think you're making the money. That's a problem. If you think you're doing anything in this world and it's not Hashem, that's a problem. That's a serious problem. Because it says in the Gemara, Masechet Rosh Hashanah, page 16b, and Masechet Beitzab, 16a, that Hashem decides what kind of parnasa and how much you're going to get on Rosh Hashanah. 
Oshana, you go to the Knesset, everybody says, Chatan, Avinu, Pashanu, we're all sorry, we messed up, do, do, do. Hashem, give me Panasa, Hashem decides, okay, Steve is going to get a million bucks. David's going to get a hundred thousand. Whoever is going to be, yes, yeah, Steve's good. Uh, you know, Wilbur is going to get negative a million. And so, I mean, scandal, you know. So the point is, he decides how much everybody's going to get. He decides. But the Baal Shem Tov said, I don't understand. If Hashem decides on Rosh Hashanah how much I'm going to get, why does the Mishnah, which came before the Gemara, say that he also checks every day? If he already checked on Rosh Hashanah, and he decided on Rosh Hashanah, why is he checking and deciding every day also? So one day a guy that was selling water passed by the Baal Shem Tov and Baal Shem Tov said, oh, Shalom Aleichem, how are you? He says, oh, Baruch Hashem, Kvod very good, I have a job, 20 years, I'm carrying water, I make panasa, everything is good, everything is good. Thank you, Baruch Hashem. He says, okay. The next day he sees the same exact guy, nothing changed, the weather's the same. He says, how are you? He says, ah, Shem Rechem, what kind of job I have, it's so hard, 20 years I'm carrying this heavy water, it's so difficult, I don't understand why Hashem did this to me. The Baal Shem Tov says to him, wow, you just gave me a chidush, you gave me an insight. Me, I gave you, I'm carrying water for 20 years. What insight do I have? <laughs> he says, for 20 years, I'm trying to figure out if Hashem already decided on Rosh Hashanah, how much I'm going to get. Why does the Mishnah say he decides every day? If he already decided on Rosh Hashanah, what is he deciding every day? So on Rosh Hashanah, he decides how much I'm going to get. Every day he decides how I'm going to get it. How I'm going to get it. Am I going to get it for my job? Or am I going to get a Shem Rechem from an accident? One guy was decided on Rosh Hashanah, you're going to make a million dollars. But his salary was only 100,000. Why? A bus hit him, so he got the other 900,000. What kind of Panasa? Is that a Panasa that you want? No. No logical person wants that kind of Panasa. He says, don't thank you for the million dollars. I'd rather have the 100,000 be very happy. Be very happy with the, be very happy, no, no accident, no nothing. But believe it or not, there was one guy I knew, this guy Danny Spiegel that I know from years ago, Somebody asked such a question, he goes, oh, this guy is such a lucky guy, he got hit by a truck and he got $15 million. <laughs> <laughs> he actually said this. And I'm looking, I'm, I was like, this is maybe 20 years ago almost, I'm looking at this guy, something's wrong with him. He doesn't realize that the bus and the train and stuff, when you hit you, it hurts. He doesn't realize, he's just thinking about the bank account, he doesn't realize, he doesn't see his eyes. But that's sometimes us. Sometimes that's us. Sometimes we have no idea what's right, what's left. And we make ridiculous mistakes. We go against the hand that feeds us. Hashem Barach teaches us things on a day-to-day basis. For example, one of the best Musar books that you could ever read is your Sidu. Sidu. Simple Sidu. Now somebody looks at you and you say, Sidu, Musar, what are you talking about? Just pray. Because that's the point. On your Sidu, you have Tefillat Shmon three times a day. Three times a day you're supposed to do Tefillat Shmon or a.k.a. Amida. And on Amida, you're supposed to say modim anachnu lach. The modim. You know, on Amida, you say modim. Everybody knows modim. Why? We go over it twice. The chazan say, well, you forgot to do it or something happened. That's Rabbanan. We have to do it again. When he goes over the shots, he goes over the whole tefillah. You say modim anachnu. He do it again. But Pachad Yitzchak says, we're making a mistake here. Why are we making a mistake? We think that we're saying thank you to Hashem twice. Because it says, Modim anachnu lach, which, Shatau Adonai Eloheinu ve'eloi avotenu le'olam va'ed. And then later on it says, Nodeh lach, u'nesaper tilatecha. So, Nodeh ve'modeh is technically the same word. But Pachad Yitzchak says, no. Modeh means also, I acknowledge. Nodeh means I think. First, you need to know where it's coming from. Acknowledge the hand that feeds you. Then say thank you. You can't say thank you if you don't know where it came from. If you're just saying thank you blindly, it's worthless. Somebody left you a present. You say, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Your wife is saying, well, thank you. I did it. What are you thanking you? Thank you. Well, I gave, I gave you the food. What thank you? Were you just thanking the walls? I'm the one that slaved all day for the food. What are you thinking? The walls? The, the parrot? What are you thinking? Me, right? I say thank you to me. I beat you chew it. Say thank you the right way. What are you thinking? Who are you thinking? Your friend? Acknowledge where it came from. Acknowledge where it came from. Then say thank you. If you don't know where it came from, your thank you is worthless. 
Hashem Itbarach says, this is in your tefillah three times a day. If you don't know where it came from, your tefillah is worthless. If you don't know where your panasa is coming from, everything, everything is upside down. So first things first, Hashem says, start your day with thanking Hashem. Thank you, Hashem, for bringing me back by Nashema. And having Emuna in me to give me another chance. You had mercy to have Emuna in me. Hashem has Emuna in me. Hashem has Emuna in you. What do you mean, Hashem? You're supposed to have Emuna in Him. What we don't know is the Gemara Masechet Bachot says that every night, when we go to sleep, our neshama goes to Shemaim. There's a small part of the neshama stays here. A large part of the neshama goes up there. That's why sleep is considered one sixtieth of death. So the neshama goes up to Shemaim and it says, Hashem, this guy, he's a rasha, look, he stole from this one, he said this one, he looked at this girl, looked at that, he tells, tells on you. Tells on you all the things you did. So Hashem, look what this guy did. I don't want to go back. Before you put me in his body, I was tzaddik, I was kosher. <laughs> you put me in his body, this guy, Hashem, Hashem, what this guy is. Don't put me back. I don't want to go back. Hashem says, I have a munai in him that today he's going to do tshuva. No, Hashem, yesterday you said the same thing. It didn't work. He says, I command you to go back. I have a munai today. He or she are going to do tshuva today. And he forces the neshama to go back. Why? Today is going to be the day. Today you're going to do tshuva. So that's why you say every day, Modani lefanecha, Modani lefanecha. Thank you, Hashem, for having emuna in me. Why emuna? Today I'm going to do tshuva. Today I'm going to actually go to Bikneset. Today I'm going to give staka. Today I'm going to keep Shabbat. Today I'm going to do whatever I didn't do yesterday. Now sometimes you wake up, Tisha B'Av. You ever wake up like that, bad mood, nothing happened yet, but you're already angry at your wife? She didn't do anything. She's still sleeping, but you're angry at her, nothing happened? Or sometimes she woke up, she's looking at you, she's thinking, oh, man, I married this guy 30 years already. What, 30 years ago you married him, now you're upset? She's upset already, nothing happened, though. No. Why are you upset? Why are you so upset? Because the neshama heard some bad news. Why? He says, look, Hashem, look what he did, look what she did. She wore a mini skirt, she wore a tank top yesterday, Hashem. Do, 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 do. What I, she... Hashem says, yeah, you're right. Midat adin, the yetzara, the malach the satan, it's all the same thing. He says, Hashem, it's time to punish. Hashem says, what she did yesterday, what he did yesterday, we got to do something about it. He gives the neshama bad news. The neshama knows the bad news. The body doesn't. That's why the neshama wakes up, Tisha Be'av. Neshama wakes up with a bad mood. Why? He knows today is going to be a bad day. Today is going to be a bad day. Why? I heard Shemaim. Today is going to be a flat tire. It's going to be this. It's going to lose some money. Do, 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 do. All the different things. Today is going to be a bad day. So what does a smart person do? A smart person knows, I woke up Tisha B'Av, I woke up with a bad mood, it's time to do Tshuva. Why? So tomorrow is not the same thing. So tomorrow is not the same thing. What does a fool do? He starts breaking stuff, making today even worse than yesterday. So what does that guarantee? Tomorrow is going to be worse. Now for me, Rabotai Karim, not knowing any of what I just said to you most of my life, every day was a bad day. Regardless of how much money we made, regardless of what we did, it didn't make a difference. Every single day I'd wake up instead of Modeani, I curse. Why? I always thought I was late to something, even though I was the boss. Even though I was the boss, I made the times, I made the hours, I told everybody what to do. I always thought I was late. So the first word out of my mouth, I'm not joking even or exaggerating, first word out of my mouth would be a curse. Oh, doop. Why? I'm late. To what? It's five o'clock in the morning. I don't know, to something. Why? The Neshama heard in Shemaim, this guy, what? This guy is getting bad news today. So, the problem is, is that when you don't know, you don't know how to fix it. Now, we came to the U.S. when I was 10 years old. We lived, I was born in Netanya. And in the U.S., what we didn't realize is that we are in a generation of yetomim, of orphans. It's very hard to find real leaders. It's very hard to find the real truth in the world. It's very hard to even find real friends. So, a real friend is not a friend that is there to borrow money from you. A real friend is not there for, uh, you know, for, to come to your parties. A real friend is the one that tells you, hey, by the way, you're going the wrong direction. That's a real friend. A real friend is going to tell you when the train's coming to hit you. Hey, move out of the way, buddy. That's a real friend. A real friend is going to tell you some tough things sometimes, but it's true. 
It's tough to find real friends. Why? Because everybody has a bias. Everybody wants something. They're friends with you when everything is good. They disappear like uh, smoke when everything is bad. That's just the reality in the world today. Sometimes they want money. Sometimes they want your girlfriend. Sometimes they want your wife or something else. Sometimes they want your job, but they befriend you first. Oh, I didn't mean to take the CEO job. Oh, you wanted it? What do you mean? I was the CEO for 20 years. <laughs> of course I wanted it. Oh, I didn't mean to. Okay, well, can you give it back? No, and now I have it. See, that's the thing. is that people pretend like they, they're your friends, but the reality is there's always a bias. It's hard to find a real friend. An old smart man told me one time, he's like, listen, at my age, if you have one friend your entire life, you're a very lucky guy. At that time, I had like maybe 20, 30 friends. I'm like, wow, 20, 30? He goes, yeah. Live and learn. <laughs> I thought he was joking. Then I realized, wow, he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> so when I was young, I had friends like everybody else. I was in school like everybody else. I also had some jobs when I was in high school. And I was a good student in school, but I got introduced to making money very, very young. I already had my first job when I was 10. Worked in a flea market. And then by the time I was a teenager... I worked in the flea market, I had newspaper routes, and I also worked in a couple of stores selling shoes, selling uh, uh, clothes, all types of things. By the time I was 17, I was already a very good salesman. I was already making $100,000 a year selling computers and electronics. And realized that, you know, I wanted to do more, but in order to do more, maybe I have to go to school. So I tried continuing this education stuff, and I went to a very good school called Binghamton University. I had nearly a perfect GPA, but at the end of the year, I decided that I don't want to go back. The majority of the people that were there didn't have a clue of what they wanted. All they wanted to do is party all day. And even though I enjoyed my share of partying, it still wasn't necessarily my life. So I realized that staying in school was just a complete waste of time for me because I just wanted to make money. I didn't want to be a doctor. I didn't want to be a lawyer. I just wanted to make money. How do you make money? You could do it to one of those professions or you could do something else. So I figured I already know how to be a salesman, so let me do something else. So I got into Wall Street. Now, the first three years of working, I just paid my dues, meaning my bosses made a fortune and I made nothing. I'd make a couple hundred dollars a week. they make a couple hundred thousand. Good deal. After three years of doing this, I uh, finally became independent within a company, this company called Raymond James. And a uh, big firm had about 5,000 brokers at the time. And uh, the first so-called partner or boss or whatever you want to call it guy after he did some shady business with me and stole some stuff from me the uh owner of the branch told me listen you can go on your own you can be independent but just make sure that the four thousand dollars a month in bills that uh i'm due it comes on time so he asked me what how are you going to get this money to me do you have any money i said no i already spent it i don't have any more money from the old days that i actually made money how are you going to pay it? I said, I have no idea. But I'm not going to go to another firm and start this whole game again. So I'll figure out to get you the money. He's like, all right, so what's your intentions here? Now at this point, I'm 21 years old. I have long hair, like a ponytail. And he's in a business for 20 years with short hair and professional. And I tell him to buy you out. That's my intentions here. <laughs> so he found it very amusing. I was actually very serious, but... Neither one of us knew what was going to happen. He found it amusing enough to give me a chance. As long as his money is paid, and every month, whatever money I got, went to him. For the first six months, it was very difficult because pretty much every penny I made went to him. So every day I would have to borrow a dollar from this guy, Dimitri, so I could buy coffee and a donut, and that was my food for the day. After six months, I f finally made $1,000 for myself, which was like a million dollars. Then you fast forward, the next month I made another 5000 the next month I made 7000 and 15000 then in November of 2002, about a year after I started, I made $117,000 in one month, which was a new record for the office. Life changed forever at that moment, because at that point, not only have I made money, I made money for a good reason. My clients made money in a terrible market. Market went down 26%, we actually made 70%, this is a pretty good deal, so they started telling me about all their friends. So at that point, money started pouring in, $50,000, dollars $200,000 a month. By August of 2003, a year later, I became the number three producing broker in the entire country for that company, Raymond James, out of 5,000 people. The rest of the list 
you know, top 20 list or people that were in it for years, tw 20 years, 25 years, 30 years. Like, who's this new guy? One day, the CEO of Raymond James calls my office and talks to the supervisor, the compliance supervisor. And the compliance supervisor let me hear the call after the fact. I don't think he was supposed to, but such is life. And the supervisor asked, I only listened for about 30 seconds of it because I lost interest. And the reason why is because the CEO of the company asked, who is this guy? And he's like, oh, he's a young kid, works hard. He's here at 6 o'clock in the morning. He leaves at 1 o'clock in the morning. He's pretty much here all the time. He sleeps here practically. It's like, yeah, but how is he making money in a bad market when the rest of our experts are losing? So he works hard, does research, does this, does this. He goes, no, 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 really, how is he making money? Does he have insider information? Meaning, how, there's no way that this young kid is doing something that the experts, the best of the best, are not able to do. It's not acceptable. We're spending a billion dollars a year on research. This kid's doing it for free. How could it be? So at that moment, I realized that I have to make a decision. I'm either going to stay there forever and play by their rules, pretty much use their research and their tools and their everything and pretty much be like a lot of little sheep in the mix of things. Or I start my own thing. And that's what I did. I started my own firm. I started hiring people. Money continued pouring in, Baruch Hashem. And that was life. Life was based on money. Now, money itself never really mattered to me. To me, it was always paper. For some reason or another, Hashem didn't make me with an inclination to care about money. Not when I was a kid, not when I was older, not today. It just never really mattered to me. You needed to eat, to drink. But as far as like toys and things like that, I never did any of that. Even though we had a ton of money, we never bought planes or fancy schmancy cars or anything. The fanciest thing I had was an apartment, but I needed to live in it too. Other than that, it was, you know, a stock portfolio. That's it. I liked buying stuff that was valuable, that I could increase in value. But as far as watches or anything like that, I never spent a single dollar on jewelry, even though I have family in the business. It just never mattered. None of it mattered to me. But I liked the chase. I liked, the, you know, the actual aggression of actually winning. And the feeling of winning. And that was the case every day. Every day was another day to make a million. Every day was another day to make something. When my friends, or in some cases my employees, would go on vacation and I would work, when they would come back, they would tell me about their story of, oh, he met this girl, he met that girl, he met this, and I'm like, yeah, I made this money. Yeah, you met some girl and she doesn't know who you are and you spent $5,000 on that and I made 200000 so... I don't know, do you think it was worth it? So that was, the, what, that was what mattered. But as life would progress, money became less and less meaningful. Because then you start looking, okay, so then I made money, now what? We got from a point, okay, so we made a dollar, and made a million, and made two million, and made five million, okay, so now what? You start printing money pretty much. Start making so much money, you don't know what to do with it. Okay, so you invest in this, and you buy this, and you do this. Now what? You start looking for the meaning to life. You start looking for happiness. So you, what do you do? Okay, so you find a relationship. Tried a few relationships that didn't work out. But one day I met an amazing woman that was actually my trader. She worked for a different company in Florida. I was in New York on Wall Street. And uh, we struck out a friendship on the phone, but I never knew what she looked like. One day I was invited to a conference. And I saw what she looked like. And then I decided I have to be nicer. <laughs> so we became friends. And then I convinced her to go out on a date with me. And we had a long-distance relationship for a little while. And then I decided that, you know what, why don't you come out and move out to New York? And uh, she said yes. And we started a firm together. And we started a life together. There was only one problem. She was perfect in every single way, but she wasn't Jewish. Interestingly enough, even though she was brought up Christian, she wanted me to be a religious Jew. She bought me my first Tanakh. And she said, you know, you really should learn this. She knew the book of Proverbs, which in Hebrew is Mishle, by heart. And she said, you know, you're a Jew, you should really learn this stuff. 
<laughs> I said, ah, later on when I'm older and I'm this and I'm that, I'm more focused on this. He goes, no, it's really going to answer a lot of the questions you have. You have a lot of inner battles. You're always angry. You're always <laughs> upset. So you're making all this stuff, but there's nothing here. Like, you're upset. He's like, upset constantly. I, was, I suffered from depression for years. Like, for no reason. I would just one day just wake up to each other nothing happened. Like, I just, you know, one day I made $600,000 in a day. It was, like, the highlight of my career at that moment. And I just went back to work, and one of the people said, wait, didn't you just make, like, a ton of money? I'm like, yeah. He goes, so what are you doing? I'm like, working. He's like, why? I said, what else am I going to do? He's like, why don't you go and party? I'm like, for what? I have to go to work. Like, it, it didn't matter to me, this, all this money. Just, made, just, that, was just that was the life. Other than that, nothing else interests me because... Here was the only thing that I was looking to challenge, and to make money requires a challenge, requires a mental capacity, requires you to make certain trades, make certain sales, get certain things to happen. Going out, having a few drinks had, had no interest whatsoever. But this, when it comes to just the material world, is not enough. It's not enough, eventually it gets old. So my wife told me she should read this Torah and said, yeah, one day, one day, one day. It's not really relevant to my life. Moshe Rabbeinu is nice, but... He's from 3,000 years ago. I need something more up-to-date. I didn't know I had so much value. Now the Rambam says that before the Mashiach comes, there's going to be 15 days of darkness. Whatever we saw in Egypt will be magnified. In the book of Jeremiah, Hashem Baruch says to Am Yisrael, when the Mashiach comes, Hashem will no longer be known as the God that took Egypt Am Yisrael out of Egypt, but rather the God that took Am Yisrael out of the land of the north and the rest of the world. Now, Rabbi Karim, if you look at today's map, there's only one place in the world that has the word north in it. North America. Interestingly enough, North America also has the most amount of Jews in the world outside of Israel, because it includes Canada and the United States. And Hashem Itbar says in the book of Jeremiah that before Mashiach comes, just like he took us out of Egypt, he's going to take us out of the land of the north and the rest of the world. Meaning that the land of the north has the most amount of Jews, logically, as we see today. And the rest of the world is the rest of the world, whether it's France or wherever else, Australia and so on and so forth. But before all this happens, there's going to be a lot of problems. There's going to be a war called Gogu Magog. There's going to be mayhem. First, Esav and Ishmael are going to get into a fist fight. Esav being the Christians, and Ishmael being the Arabs, the Muslims. We're seeing some of that starting now. After that, the Nevi'im say that both of them are going to realize that all of this fight is because of one thing. It's called Jerusalem. And this Jerusalem place is under control by these little people called Jews, which we commonly both hate anyway. So they decide to stop fighting each other, and then they go fight the Jews. And the prophecies get scarier and scarier. Now, if I told you all of this two, three, four hundred years ago, all of you say, ah, yeah, this guy is, uh, thinks he's a prophet. Today, you don't need to be a prophet. You just turn on the news. It's happening. Like it or don't like it. Hashem is not waiting for your business to get a big contract. Hashem is not waiting for you to finish the remodeling on your house. Hashem is not waiting. Time's up. The Rambam says that these 15 days of darkness are five times what we had in Egypt. In Egypt, we had three days of darkness. During those three days of darkness, Hashem killed many of the Egyptians, but unfortunately, many of the Jews too. 80% of the Jews died in the plague of darkness. Some say much more. Some say it wasn't one out of five of Bnei Israel that left Egypt, which is 80% died and 20% survived. But rather, Rav Nachmani in one of the Tanaim and the Gemara says, Alvai, Alvai, it was one out of 500,000. Alvai. Meaning that only two people out of every million survived. Two people out of every million. We used to have 300 million members of Nei Israel, three million left. He says, Alvai, it's that. Meaning it was potentially even worse. Why? Why was it so much bad? Why was it so bad? 
Why does Hashem kill so many of us? Just leave us there. He says, if you don't want to do tshuva, there's no point. You don't want to fulfill the mitzvot, there's no point. Why? I created the Torah 974 generations before I created the world. Meaning, the world was created for the Torah, not for Bnei Yisrael. The Bnei Yisrael is to fulfill the Torah. If Bnei Yisrael don't want to fulfill the Torah, I take it back. In the Gemara Masechet Shabbat, we see something peculiar. One of the greatest Baal Tshuva in all of history. His name is Resh Lakish. Resh Lakish used to be a gangster, head of the gangsters. Resh Lakish says, how come when we see Parashat Bereshit, we see Vayi Erev Vayi Boker Yom Rishon, Vayi Erev Vayi Boker Yom Sheni. Every day we see it was evening, it was morning, end of first day. It was evening, it was morning, end of second day. It was evening, it was morning, third day, fourth day, fifth day. Yom Rishon, Yom Sheni, Yom Shlishi, Yom Revi, Yom Chamishi. But then when we get to Yom Shishi, to the sixth day, it says Vayi Erev Vayi Boker Yom Hashishi. So Resh Lakish says there's a superfluous letter, there's a letter, there's a hay, there's an extra hay in this word. What do we need this extra hay for? Why did Hashem use an extra hay? There's an extra letter. We know the Torah has 304,805 letters, a lot of letters. We know not even one single one of them is extra. Not a single one is extra, not a single sentence, not a single letter. What is this extra letter? We have extra hay. All the other days, it says Yom Rishon, Yom Sheni, Yom Shlishi, Yom Revi, Chamishi. Yom Shishi, you say it in Kiddush on Shabbat. Yom Ashi, Vayechul HaShamayim, Vayaretz. You say, you, you say it all the time. If you don't say it, we have to do a different shiur. <laughs> so what is this Yom HaShishi? What do we have this extra hey? Yom HaShishi, meaning it's the sixth day. Not sixth day, the. There's an extra the. There's an extra word. So Resh Laki says... This is a signature. What's the signature? Of a deal. A deal made between Hashem Barach and the angel that's in charge of earth. There's an angel in charge of everything. There's an angel in charge of the sun. There's an angel in charge of the moon. There's an angel in charge of grass telling it to grow every day. There's an angel in charge of every single thing. It's one It's the servants of Hashem. Why? Does Hashem need help? No, but that's not the way of a king to just do everything himself. So he has servants. That's why he created angels. So the angel that's in charge of earth, Hashem says, listen, we have a deal. Now that I'm creating everything, we're almost finished with creation, we're creating man. But just so you know, it's all for the Torah. And a little while from now, I'm going to give this Torah to these people called Bnei Yisrael. If they accept it, we're going to get to Shabbat. We go from Shishi to Shabbat. We're going to fulfill the mitzvah of Shabbat. If they accept the Torah... They're going to keep Shabbat. We get the Shabbat. We finish the week. Baruch Hashem. The world continues. If they don't, the Gemara says, then we're going back to Tov Avo. We're going back to how, what you were before all of this. Why? There's no point. So the hay, the extra hay, also has a numerical value of what? Five. What's five? Five books of Moses. If Am Yisrael accepts his Torah, they accept the five books of Moses, we get the Shabbat. They don't accept it, we're going back to Tov Avo. We're going back to nothingness. Why? The world was created to fulfill the Torah. Now when a person's on Wall Street and interested in finding frauds on Wall Street, finding deals on Wall Street, finding interesting things to make money out of, you start telling them things about Moshe Rabbeinu, Avraham Avinu, all this stuff. It's like, yeah, it's nice, it's a good story. <coughs> but how is it relevant to me? And the reason why is because we think that the Torah is an option. It's optional. If you want to keep it, keep it. If you don't want to keep it, don't. That's what I thought most of my life. I said, okay, so Hashem said, don't work. I believed in Hashem, at least my own version of it. He said, don't work on Shabbat. I said, okay, no problem, I'm not going to work. I'll go to the casino instead. <laughs> it's not work. It's fun for me. No? Mistake. So Hashem said to, you know, don't light fire. I'm not lighting fire. I'm only driving a car. Not lighting fire on Shabbat, I'm only driving a car. I didn't realize that according to one of my engineer students, he said that when you drive a car every five minutes, you're lighting 6,000 fires. You drive a car on Shabbat, every few minutes, it's 6,000, not one fire, it's 6,000 fires. So when a person thinks they're making a mitzvah, going to be Knesset with their car, they violated Shabbat probably 60, 70, 80,000 times. 
They think they're doing mitzvah, but they're violating the Ten Commandments. They're violating the entire Torah. There's no mitzvah. There's no commandment, go to shul. There's a commandment, keep Shabbat. It's the fourth commandment. The fourth commandment. Shem says, no, you know, I'm the only God. Don't use my name in vain. Don't worship idols. Keep Shabbat. And then go to shul. No. The next commandment is respect your, honor your parents. There's no go to shul. If you can go to shul by walking, ashrecha. If you can't, move. Move closer to the shul. But there's no permission in the entire Torah for anyone to drive on Shabbat to go to shul. The only time you have permission is if you go into the hospital because there's a life danger. Then Shabbat is on hold. Shabbat's on hold. Why is Shabbat on hold? Because we want to save his life so he can keep more Shabbats. Which shows us that it's not that his life is more valuable than Shabbat, but rather the Shabbat is more valuable than his life. So we want to keep him alive so he can keep more Shabbats. So now, Rabotai, Hashem told us that before Mashiach comes, we're all going to get this wake-up call. Am Yisrael got a wake-up call. They didn't want to do tshuva. Hashem says, okay, I made a deal with the malach. I made a deal with everybody. You don't want to do tshuva. You're ruining the whole deal. So I'll just save the ones that want to do fulfill the deal. The ones that don't, I don't need you. The Rambam says, before Mashiach comes, it's going to be 15 days of darkness. Not three. Why? Because he's closing the store on the entire world. Meaning it's not just Ami Sled that he's finishing the, the, the counting with. He's finishing accounting with everyone. And that's why the prophet Zechariah says that before Mashiach comes, two-thirds of the world will die. So, and the way he describes it 3,000 years ago, it's exact description of an atomic war. Very scary. Now, if somebody does tshuva, they have nothing to worry about. Nothing to worry about. doesn't matter where you live. You can live here. You can live in uh, Afghanistan. You can live in Israel. You can, if somebody does tshuva, they have zero to worry about. If someone doesn't want to do tshuva, they have everything to worry about. <coughs> Why? You're not on the protected list. So now, before this 15 days of darkness, before this big war, before all this bad news happens, Hashem is going to give each one of us a bunch of chances. So first he sends you a text message. Then he sends you an email. Sends you a WhatsApp. Sends you a Facebook friend, friend request. He sends you a letter. He knocks on your door. It's a bunch of different checks. Many of us ignore these checks. Sometimes it's a flat tire. Sometimes it's a money loss. Sometimes it's a little bit of pain on your side. Different checks. I ignored a lot of these checks. So November 18th, 2006, I wanted to have an elective surgery. It was only a couple of months after I made the most amount of money I made in, in my career. I made $1.6 million in one month. Technically, it was made in one day. So I took a vacation for a month. I went to Vegas. I thought that life was grand. Played in the World Series of Poker. All these fancy schmancy players, which, by the way, are complete losers. No, in real life, they're, they're good poker players, but in actual real life, they're all degenerates. They all do drugs, they all, you know, connected to the degenerate life of prostitution and so on. They look good on TV, though. So anyway, if you're in that business, it's, 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 it's part of the business, unfortunately. It's the same thing as being a celebrity. It's part of the business. It comes with it. So now, I had a vacation. I made a lot of money. Everything was good. I figured, you know what? I have some spare time. I have some spare money. Let me fix my health a little bit. There was something that was annoying me once in a while. Maybe once, twice a year. I had hemorrhoids, like two-thirds of the population. And it was annoying me enough to say, you know what? Let me look into it. So my brother told me about one of these doctors that he knows, this guy in, uh, in New York, Dr. Lacqua. And I went to go visit Dr. Lacqua. Dr. Lacqua was a very... Big professional, successful. He says he does two, three, or four surgeries per day. It's like a factory. And he said, listen, you have a common problem. Don't worry about it. Two-thirds of the population has it. Pregnant women have it. Old people have it. Young people have it. Kids sometimes have it. Everybody has it. Don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. It's not cancer. It's hemorrhoids. Have a surgery. I said, okay, no problem. This, no problem. This, this is not a big problem. Good. But how much time am I out of work? That's the only thing that mattered to me. Why? Every hour that I work is $3,200. It's 
to work for one hour show up to work one hour average thirty two hundred dollars meaning that if i take off a day it's ten hours work is thirty two thousand dollars you do the math i take off a week it's a lot of money so how much time he said listen you come on wednesday you're back to work on monday i said okay that's worth it so i came on wednesday i thought everything was good we had the surgery i went to sleep like most people go to sleep only difference is when i woke up i didn't wake up like most people most people wake up maybe a little comfortable uncomfortable maybe they don't feel like waking up maybe a little discomfort maybe they're still tired but very rarely does somebody wake up screaming and yelling in pain like somebody took a dagger that's connected to the electric outlet and started cutting up their body over and over again without stopping. That's the way I woke up. With massive pain, screaming my lungs out and begging whoever would listen to please kill me and take me out of my misery. Now this pain just wouldn't stop, so they gave me morphine and it still wouldn't stop. And they gave me more and it still wouldn't stop. The same God that I've been ignoring for most of my life, or at least treating him like he was one of my boys, keeping what I felt like keeping, doing what I felt like doing, he said, oh, you need me. Sorry. When I called you, you didn't answer. Why do you think I'm going to answer? If anyone thinks that I'm exaggerating, you actually say this in your parashat Shavua every year. Parashat Bechukotai. And also Parashat Kitavo. Hashem Yitbarach says to Am Yisrael, Ve'alachtem imi bekeri. If you treated me with casualness, Ve'alachtem imchem bechamat keri. I went with you with double casualness. Meaning, if you treat me like I'm one of your friends and you casually keep my mitzvot, what you like, you keep. What you don't like, you don't keep. What you like to eat, you eat. Well, if it's allowed or not allowed, you just treat my Torah like it's a newspaper then you get two punishments. One punishment is for sin, one punishment is for treating me like I'm one of your boys, like I'm one of your friends from the bar. I called, he didn't answer. The nightmare of all nightmares came to life for me at least. After a while of screaming and yelling, they gave me the most amount of morphine allowed. They told me that this would kill most people, but it's allowed legally. It finally calmed my body down, I thought that it's finally over. Now, since this was an elective surgery, there was no planned hospital stay or anything. It's just, again, hemorrhoids. This wasn't supposed to happen. So they thought, ah, there was a little mix-up, a little mess-up, but it's over. He's calm. It's good. Please get out of here. Go home. I went home. We go picked up, we picked up a shawarma sandwich on the way. Had a nice sandwich. My family, I said, thank you very much for coming. It was a very interesting day. If I didn't know what Jaganom looks like, now I do, but I'm going to sleep. I thought it was over. I went to sleep. I woke up 45 minutes later with worse screams than I did before. Only this time, it didn't stop for 62 days. Not six hours. 62 days. 62 days of screaming and yelling and watching my body die. My body started failing. Something happened in a surgery. They did something to one of the nerves. No one knows till this day, over 13 years later, 12 years later, what actually happened. We know now it's a sham, but nonetheless, physically, we have no idea. But all they knew is that my body started failing and I started dying slowly in a very interesting way. Started urinating blood. My eyes started bleeding. My ears started bleeding wasn't able to move but the pain wasn't in one part of the body that was relevant to the surgery it was everywhere everywhere hurt it wasn't like oh where does this hurt no everywhere hurt and they had no idea why and nothing worked the only thing that would work that would actually allow me to sleep for about 15 minutes was taking about 20 to 30 painkillers sometimes as much as 50 and then dipping my body into boiling water the type of water that would hurt if it touched your hand the type of water that would be like for like tea but this would be like a different type of pain so for me it was like numbing and then it would allow me to sleep for 15 minutes and then i would wake up because all the numbing wore off and we started all over again 
Now, when you don't sleep for a long time, you start dying. And that's what was happening. But after two months, Hashem had mercy. Apparently, I called out his name enough times. And remembered who my maker was. So he gave me another chance. Pain started subsiding for no reason whatsoever. I started coming back to myself to some extent. I said, okay, so maybe I can start going back to work. Maybe start going back to life. Still have no idea what just happened, but second chance at life. I go back to work. I'm still in a lot of pain. It's very hard for me to walk. So to go from here to, let's say, for example, the end of the room would take me maybe 15 minutes instead of 15 seconds. And then went back to my life, went back to using my brain to make money, went back to running my business in pain, but nonetheless still back. Nine months later, I get a pain in the back of my leg, different than any other pain I've ever had. By the next day, I'm in the emergency room, and they told me that I have an infection between two muscles, that if I didn't show up to the emergency room at that moment, if I would have waited maybe another hour or two, the abscess that's in between those two muscles was ready to explode go into my blood system and probably kill me within an hour so we have to have an emergency surgery and you're going to be in the icu unit for a while next to all the people that are dying and got shot and so on so i was in the icu unit for the next three weeks pressing the morphine button 24 hours a day and second surgery back to life back to work Back to Wall Street, back to painkillers, but back. Thought it was over. Still no tshuva, still no Shabbat, still married to the same amazing woman that wasn't Jewish. Thought I had another chance at life. This was just a you know, happenstance. It happens. It happens to people. People get into accidents. People's stuff happens. So it happened to me too. You know, everybody says, oh, it's never going to happen to me until it happens to you. I said, okay, so it happened to me. Big deal. I'm still here. Be positive. Be optimistic. Six months later, another pain, different side, completely unrelated to the first two. Back in the hospital, another emergency surgery, another ICU unit, more pain. Three months later, back in the emergency room, in the ICU unit, another surgery. More painkillers, more pain. And then every month, and then every day. And then I got to a point where I had to be at a hospital every month and the doctors at least three to four times a week. I became part of an experiment because they had no idea what happened to my body, so they figured that we just try stuff. I went to a dentist one time because I had a problem with my tooth. He told me that I have to donate my skull to the lab at one point after I die. I said, why? He said, because it's unusual. It doesn't go to sleep. Your body doesn't go to sleep like a normal person. I have to give you more shots than most people. It doesn't make sense. You should donate your skull to science. He found it amusing. I kind of didn't because I was in pain. <laughs> he still collected the $5,000 for the root canals that he did. What is joke. So then after that, I went to a different experiment. Another guy told me that we should inject your body with ozone. Ozone therapy, it's called. They inject your body with purified air, which logically you would think would kill you, but actually it's supposed to heal you or purify your blood. To me, it felt like they were killing me and injecting me with poison. I did this for a while. Every time I did it, I felt like I was dying for a few hours, but I thought maybe this is going to cure me. But little by little, my body started deteriorating. It wasn't just the pain from the lower body. It was pain everywhere. One day I wake up and my legs start hurting. The next day they double in size. I'm in the emergency room again. And the doctor over there that's supposed to be an expert that went to school for a million years tell me maybe it's from the heat. I said, you think that my legs doubled in size in 24 hours because of the heat? He's like, yeah, why? No. I said, maybe your brain is... Me, uh, shrunk from the heat. <laughs> this is, you went to school, you should go back to school if that's what you think happens. It wasn't a good diagnosis. I don't think he liked my response either. So my legs doubled in size. Now I can't walk. I walk with a cane for the next year and a half or so. One idiot from my building thought that it was a style. It was like a fashion statement. So he got a cane for himself too. 
see another 20 something year old guy walking around with a cane thinking it's a fashion statement people would do anything just to get some looks my cane was pretty cool though <laughs> so anyway so life was grand how long did this last seven years seven years of 24 hours a day seven days a week with no break of pain 24 hours a day some of the pain I'm telling you about some of the pain I'm gonna spare you I'm not gonna tell you it's really too graphic if anybody wants to know what happens in game no I can tell you but that's what was happening it got to a point where it's so bad that I started giving surgeries to myself the doctors were fools they simply were just cutting me just to see what happens so I said forget the doctors let me just do this myself if an infection appeared all I knew is that I need to get it out okay so I don't have Novocaine okay so I can't make myself numb but I can definitely cut myself and scream and yell in pain but at least I'm not in the hospital for the next two weeks so you start giving yourself surgeries you start suffering but you suffer quietly and this continued Rabotai this was a nightmare when Hashem says you're gonna need me you don't want to realize it until it's too late so I started realizing that these 50 doctors that I've gone to specials you know normal regular whatever type of doctors acupuncture science experts best in the world worst in the world whatever you want we went to everyone start taking steroids like athletes everything and anything you can imagine we tried at the same time the business was going to nothing because obviously when you can't work you can't make money and it got to a point where life was not much fun and I didn't really didn't want to live much so one day I decided you know what maybe it's time for me to leave this world and start planning now one thing that the Shem does say out of the many things he says that he's not going to give you a test that you can't handle apparently I got to that point I couldn't handle it anymore couldn't handle the test I couldn't live didn't want to live anymore my mom God bless her saw that I was not just physically not well I was mentally not well you know to sit next to me in dinner was very uncomfortable because I would be constantly in pain and all of a sudden I would get a shock of pain out of nowhere like as if you're getting electrocuted it's very very uncomfortable to be next to me so I started becoming very antisocial not next to people my mom saw that I wasn't doing too well and she started calling some rabbis to see maybe I can get some blessings one day she calls everywhere she had a little black book full of rabbis names she called America Israel wherever she can get and no one was answering for two hours two hours she's calling no one's answering until somebody answers in Israel and a woman says how can I help you she asks for a certain rabbi's name she says I'm sorry it's the wrong phone number and my mom starts crying because she's been calling for two hours looking for help she finally got a human being to answer the phone but it's the wrong phone number in a different country and then Hashem makes a miracle happen the woman on the other side of the phone that's the wrong number in a different country ends up being a family relative that actually knows my mom's voice somehow even though they've never talked on the phone before her name was Penina and she was my mom's brother's daughter and she asked my mom Doris she says her name my mom was in shock how do you know my name stranger she says well I'm your niece I'm your, your niece she says how did I get to you I don't even have your phone number she says, well I, I don't know how you got to me but if you got to me then apparently Hashem wants us to talk she was actually part of the family that was religious so she says to her, okay so why are you crying she goes my, my son is dying da, 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 the whole story short version of it and uh, she says well, why don't you call Rabbi Ephraim my brother Tamit Chacham. and he also lives uh, happens to live a couple buildings away from Rabbi Avadia before he died he says you'll talk to me of course you're Dona Doris, you're the end for America. So of course I'll talk to you. You can help, whatever you can do. So she called Rabbi Ephraim. Rabbi Ephraim was in the Kolel, but he called her back. And the first question after she tells him a brief part of the story, the first question that Rabbi Ephraim asked her is, does he speak Hebrew? And she says, yes, he speaks a little bit of Hebrew. And she says, okay, so can I just call him and ask him? 
So he's not going to talk to you. He doesn't talk to anybody. He became, like I said, very antisocial. And at that very moment that she said he's not going to talk to you, I happened to call my mom for the first time in God knows how long. Because I started thinking, okay, I'm going to leave this world soon, so let me be nice to my mom. Let me call her. So I called my mom. When? At exactly the time she says he's not going to call you. And she answers the phone. She was crying on the phone to Rabbi Ephraim, and she's crying, and I'm asking her, why are you crying? Who's making you cry? She says, talk to him, talk to him. And I, who? Who? Talk to who? She says, talk to Ephraim. Like, Who's this Ephraim? Is? Why is he making you cry? And she says, he's your cousin. Maybe he can help you. I said, okay, just stop crying. Have whoever you want to call me. He calls me, and I see that this guy is not like some of the people that I know. He's not interested in money. He's really not interested in anything other than finding out things about me. And he has a lot of really good stories. So he tells me the story of Yudah in Tamal from the Torah in, uh, in uh, Sefer Bereshit. And he starts telling me different interesting stories and I see this guy has some, you know, some real, real knowledge that's beyond the knowledge that I'm, I'm expecting. So I start asking him questions. And he makes me feel good about my question. He says, oh wow, this is a really good question. Rabbi so-and-so asked the same question 850 years ago in this book on this page and this time like how does it when he happened to have the same book how do you know the page number <laughs> I, it was unbelievable i'm like okay i mean how do you know the page number 800 years ago it's long it's old i didn't know that's how tell me i mean think so he gives me the answer and he makes me feel good about my question so i said okay let me just ask another question so I ask another question, and again, he does the same thing. He goes, oh, wow, what a really good question you have. It's not a new question. I said, really? He said, yeah. Rabbi so-and-so asked the same question in this book 380 years ago on this page, in this paragraph. And I said, you happen to have both books next to him? <laughs> so I just keep asking questions for an hour and 40 minutes, and he has answers. But it's not answers like I had answers, like opinion. Everybody has an answer. You ask people, you ask a Jew an answer, I'll give you three answers if you want. We're not asking, I'm not asking for opinions. I'm asking for an answer. An answer meaning is only one. I want to know what God's opinion is. And he shows me source. He shows me a verse. He shows me a page number. He shows me that somebody asked this question. I wasn't so special after all. So I say, okay, so this is a very interesting conversation. I really want to talk to him again, but I never got his phone number. But he called me again a week later, Thursday, 4 o'clock. This time I asked questions for three hours. The next week he called me again, Thursday, four o'clock, we spoke for five hours. The next week he called me again, we spoke for seven hours. And every week we would talk for seven hours straight. My Christian wife, that always wanted me to be a religious Jew, was as excited as can be. <laughs> she said, you're finally getting the answers you've always wanted and didn't know where to get them. From now on, no one is allowed to talk to you on Thursday at 4 o'clock, except Rabbi Ephraim. She would be like my bodyguard. At Thursday, 4 o'clock, as soon as Rabbi Ephraim calls, door shut, no one's allowed to see Aaron. No one's allowed to talk to him, no one's allowed to knock, doesn't make a difference if Mashiach shows up, he has to wait until he finishes <laughs> with Rabbi Ephraim. Why? He's getting answers. She was as excited as ever, and everything I would learn, I'd, write, I'd start writing it down because it was really interesting. So I started filling up notebooks of stuff, amazing stuff, and every time it's brand new. You just come to my house and I still have notebooks full of stuff. It's unbelievable stuff. I knew she would from it. But after I finish, I have to give the shoe to somebody. Who? My wife. <laughs> so I started giving other shoe I learned this, I learned this, I learned this. I learned this. You know, we started learning everything together. Little by little, we start realizing, oh, Houston, we have a problem. I finally want to be a Jew. She wants me to be a Jew. But to be a Jew, there's some certain things you need to do. You need to listen to the Torah. You need to listen to Hashem's opinion. You need to do what He says. You need to keep Shabbat. You need to keep kosher. You need to be married to a Jew. What am I going to do? You can't just tell her, hey, stop being a Christian. You can't just tell somebody to stop breathing. You stop breathing first. See what happens. You can't just tell somebody, stop doing something. So what do I do? I'm not leaving. Who, was, who would have survived with me through this hell that I've been with? And, you know, for the last seven years of genome of surgery and this and that, she's the only one that was there. No one else was there. 
God bless everybody else, but no one else was there. No one knows the nightmare that I've gone through other than her. No one stuck with me. No one cleaned the blood. No one made me feel like I'm still a king even though I can't walk. No one was there. You think I'm going to leave that? Anyone would have said such a thing to me, would have thrown out of the window. So that wasn't an option. But at the same time, that's going against God's opinion. You can't be a, a hypocrite. He said, okay, there's only one solution. We have to find out what's true. If Christianity is true, then we're both going to be Christians. If it's not, then she's going to become a Jew, but now she's going to be Jew willingly. I'm not making her do anything. She's going to want to do it on her own. But how do you do this? So I started investigating Christianity. So I'm learning Torah, but now I'm also learning the hypocrisy of Christianity. And I start realizing that Christianity, I always thought it was like second best. I thought, you know, I, my logic was, I always made fun of Christians because I said, why would you want to be a Christian if the original Christian is really a Jew? It doesn't make any sense. But at the same token, it made sense to them. There's two billion of them. So I figured, okay, so it's like a remix. I called it a remix. You know how they used to, they would take some music from the old days, they put some new beat on it, and it just make a whole new $10 million out of it. So I figured that Christianity was like a remix of like Judaism. What I didn't realize is that not only was it not a remix, it was a hundred, and it is a hundred percent falsehood and a hundred percent idolatry. That I didn't realize, and neither did she, until we started looking into it. Now, it wasn't so difficult for me, but it was much more difficult for her because for me, I already had a bias. She didn't. So I started looking into Christianity, and I started realizing that every single page in the New Testament has a mistake. But we're not talking about mistakes that are difficult to discover. We're talking about mistakes that any six-year-old could discover if he just looks into it. For example, it says that Yaakov Avinu, in the Torah, it says it twice. The Yaakov Avinu came down to Egypt with 70 nefashot, 70 souls. This is what it says in the Torah, a.k.a. Old Testament. Now, Christianity has something called the New Testament, which means that it's a continuation of the Old Testament, meaning that the two agree with each other. It's just a new version. It's the continuation of the old book. In essence, what that means is that the two books need to agree with each other. They cannot contradict each other. So this is called a postulate. A postulate means that there is a given. There has to be certain things. So for example, it could always be where the Old Testament, a.k.a. Torah, is right, and the New Testament is right. It could mean, there could be a possibility that both have the right answer. Another postulate is that the Old Testament, the Torah, can be right, but the New Testament wrong. That's also a postulate. It's also a given. But it could never be that the Old Testament is wrong and the New Testament is right. That could never be. And the reason why is because the Old Testament came first. It can never be that the New Testament has information that contradicts the first. It can never be. Because it came first. So now, the Old Testament, the Torah, says that Yaakov Avinu came down to Egypt with 70 souls. The New Testament says 75. In more than one place. Meaning that their God forgot how to count. <laughs> forgot how to do math. Forgot what happened 1,500 years before. They also have the wrong address for Ma'at HaMachpilah. They put it in the wrong city. This is stuff that you could verify because Ma'at HaMachpilah still exists. It's under control of Arabs, but you can still find out. It's still there. They have the wrong address in the New Testament. They also have one sentence that says that their J.C. Penny is the son of God, but another, stem, another couple of places say that he's also connected to David HaMelech. How could you be connected to David Melech if you're the son of God too? <laughs> and then they show you that their Joseph guy that took a married woman, by the way, and had intimate relations with her, and that's where J.C. Penny came from, is connected to David Melech. The only problem is they show you 25 generations in two different places, two different books out of their books, but the list of 25 in both places is different. 25 different people in both places. 
and many, many other nonsensical errors like this that two billion people in the world believe today. Unfortunately, some of those people are Jewish people. Why do such so many people believe this? Because most people made the same mistake I did. They didn't check. For 30 years, I didn't check. For 30 years, I just assumed that it wasn't relevant to my life. I assumed that Wall Street and money and material, that's relevant. Torah, it's 3,000 years ago. It's old. I didn't check. I didn't realize that God's opinion doesn't change. Even Bilam knew that. Bilam the wicked. And even recent archaeological discoveries showed that even the Goim have verified our Torah in their side of the world. For example, there was a discovery in, um, in Jordan. It's actually, this is a discovery that's in their museum in Jordan. It was discovered in 1967. They discovered a scroll in one of these places of idolatry. But this scroll says that they're worshipping this goddess of sex and their leader is a person by the name of Bilam ben Bill. Who's Bilam ben Bill? He's in our Torah also. What was his whole thing and how did he almost destroy all of Am Yisrael? We failed for sex crimes. We went and made intimate relations with the Midianites and the Moabites. It says the whole story though. But from their side, not from our Torah, it's not a Torah scroll. It's their scroll telling the story from 2,800 years ago, 3,000 years ago. It's saying what's happening on their version. But this is hidden in Jordan, and it was discovered in 1967, but most people don't know it exists. I didn't until recently either. Because why? We didn't check. You don't check, you don't find out. What do we spend our our time checking? We're checking if we're going to make money. We're checking if our bank account went up or went down. We're checking if the gas company took the money this week. We're checking if uh, we have milk in the fridge. We're checking where the cat is because there's poop somewhere. We're checking a lot of things. We're not checking where God is, though. So I started checking, and I started realizing this Christianity now is no longer second best. This Christianity is idolatry. So now I'm not really caring so much about her conversion anymore. I'm caring about her life. It's now pikuach nefesh. Because now, my loved one is worshipping an idol and she doesn't even realize it. Like two billion people don't realize it. So I started showing her things that I found out. And she starts checking. And she starts realizing, wow, there's some problems here, but I need more than just this. So we start researching and researching and researching and one day we discover a um, debate by Rabbi Mizrahi, between Rabbi Mizrahi and a Christian professor that trains in Columbia University, trains priests and pastors and so on. And they had a debate a few years ago. And a debate is, in my opinion, by far the best debate between a Jew and a Christian. Hundreds of thousands of people have watched this debate. I don't think anyone ever agreed that the Christian professor won because it was really an embarrassment that they had zero answers to any real questions. All he had was just like faith and, you know, you should believe and hopefully, but no actual concrete evidence. Unfortunately, the Yetzirah that exists in all of us convinced my wife that she shouldn't watch this debate, so even to convince her to watch it was very difficult. Finally, she started watching it, but she didn't like it, so she really didn't pay attention. So then I try to give her something else. I try to give her some debates by Rabbi Tovia Singer, also an expert in the field. Yet so I again came up and convinced her that he talks too fast. So she didn't want to listen to him. And anything I would give her, there would always be a distraction. There would always be an interference. Something always happened. So we just continued doing research on our own. Eventually, she found something on her own. There's a uh, website called Ask Noah. AskNoah.org or .com which had an extraordinary argument proving the number one issue that Christians have against Judaism which is the oral Torah. Now the Christians say that they believe in the written Torah. 
but they don't believe in the oral Torah. That's the difference. We're saying that there is no written Torah without the oral Torah. And the reason why is because you cannot understand the written Torah without the oral Torah. You can't understand it. Now, I didn't know enough to explain this, but she found something extraordinary. She found a way of how to explain how this is indisputable. And one of the ways is the fact that there is something called a codex. Or in Hebrew, it's called ketel. Ketel means it's a certain book that was a scroll that was written many years ago with the nikud, with the vowel system. Now, when you, your scroll that you have here, Baruch Hashem, one, two, ten, however you have here, Baruch Hashem, Ken Yerbu, anyone that comes and sees the Sefer Torah and reads it, sees there's something missing from what you have in your books. It's on the shelves. What is it? It's the dots. There's no dots. Now, for anyone that doesn't read Hebrew, it just looks like a bunch of dots. For anyone that knows Hebrew, knows that those dots are actually the vowel system. Like in English, the vowel system is letters, A, E, I, or U, and sometimes Y. That's the vowel system. That's the foundation of the language, meaning every single word in the English language must have at least one of those letters in that word. Without it, there's no word. That's the vowel system. It's also the punctuation system. Now, in the Sefer Torah, there's no punctuation, there's no vowels. But there is a book called the Ketel, or the Codex in English, that has them. So whoever's reading from the scroll actually needs to know both. Because or else he's going to mispronounce all the words. And he's actually not going to know what it says. What is it like? It's like, for example, if you say the word, you know, Moses went to the store. Now in English, if you say Moses, you say M-O-S-E-S. Now what happens if you take out the vowels? You have to take out the O. You have to take out the E. So now Moses have turned into Miss. Miss S went to the store. It's a completely different person. Meaning that without the vowel system, there's no Torah. It's on a, it's, forget about the mitzvot. You can't understand a single word or a single sentence in the entire Torah. This is by far one of the best proofs that the oral Torah is a fundamental part of the Torah that we got from Mount Sinai. And that's exactly the part of the Torah that all the people that go against the Torah have. Why? Because the oral Torah is the one that obligates you. That's the one that tells you that if you're angry, it's considered 100% idolatry. Someone that takes a remote, he's upset, he still has a TV in his house, he doesn't realize that it's bad for his marriage, his life, and his time, and he still has it, he watches TV, and he got upset because his team lost. So sometimes people that are really passionate about sports, what do they do? They get really upset, they take the remote and they throw it. So the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat says that if somebody takes something and throws it out of anger, even if it's money, it's considered as if they've worshipped an idol. Now this is something that probably everybody here has done at some point in their life. I know I have. Not over sports, because I never cared for it, but over something. Why do we do it? Because we didn't know there was something so wrong with it. What does Hashem really care about me throwing something? Now, anger, Rabotai, is one of the things that a person needs to know. It's like committing suicide. Both in this world and the next. And the reason why is because when a person is angry, Hashem says that you're only angry because you think that you're running the world. The world didn't play to your tune. The world didn't agree with your plan. So you're upset. In essence, you've turned yourself into God. You're thinking that I'm supposed to, Hashem is supposed to dance to your tune. You ask and He fulfills. Hashem says, I don't dance to your tune. You're supposed to dance to mine. If you're so upset that you've actually gone to the extent of throwing something, breaking something, then that means that you've officially started worshipping yourself. You have a problem. Anger is so bad that it, the Gemara says that if somebody was decreed to get 70 years of good, 70 years of good, in Shemayim they decided on Rosh Hashanah, this guy's going to get seven years of reward and great, do, 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 all the time, great things. He takes something, he breaks it out of anger, like I did a million and a half times in Wall Street. He says, oh, seven years of good, deleted. 
to that extent over well, not every day, one time it could happen. That is how much Hashem detests anger. Because it shows that we have zero emunah in Him to such an extent that we think that the world has to operate according to our tune. Now the Chachamim say some serious things about it. He says, someone that learns Torah and values Torah knows that it's very hard to learn Torah, especially in the beginning. You have to sit there, you have to delve into the things. It's not just summarized for you like it is in this lecture. It's usually you have to get to the bottom of things. It takes a while. The Midrash says, as a matter of fact, Gemara in Rish Lakish, the same Baal Tshuva says, someone that gets angry, wisdom departs him. Where do we see the source? We see Moshe Rabbeinu is the source. Moshe Rabbeinu was angry three times in the entire Torah. Moshe Rabbeinu, the prophet of all prophets, Kodesh Kodeshim. Even the Mashiach is not going to be as great as Moshe Rabbeinu. In the book of Bamidbar, chapter 31, we see that Moshe became angry at the officers in charge of the troops. And the very next verse says that Elazar, the Kohen, gave a rule to Am Yisrael regarding the war. So the Chachamim say, why did Elazar give them the ruling? Why didn't Moshe give them? He says, because of his anger, he forgot. Moshe forgot what to do. Moshe forgot what to do. Moshe forgot to talk momentarily because he got angry. And this happened three times to Moshe Rabbeinu. This anger has a root. Anger comes from Gava. Anger comes from ego. Now most people that are egotistical don't consider themselves egotistical. <laughs> Trust me, I know. And the reality is, is that if you tell a guy, why are you angry? He's like, oh, because he made me mad. Of course, if he didn't make you mad, then you would be psychotic if you're still angry. <laughs> Somebody had to make you mad. But why are you mad? Because, because it didn't go according to my plan. Sa. So, that's the key. My plan. Anger has to do with I. Me. Something didn't go according to me. I had a plan. I did this. I, 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 I. And when you're so consumed with I, you forget that there's also a he and a she and a, and a you and a somebody else. When you're so consumed with yourself, you forget that the rest of the world exists. You're so consumed with your own ego, you forget that your wife is there listening to you. You forget that your husband is listening. You forget that your student is listening. You forget that your employee is listening. You forget that they're there. You forget that they have feelings. I saw a person really upset one time, and I said, why do I have to suffer for your, you know, for your bad mood? You have a bad mood? Fine. Why do I have to suffer for it, though? I didn't do it. Somebody else made you upset, fine, but why do I have to suffer? I wish I would have said the same thing to myself when I was on Wall Street. Because every day I woke up that way. Every day I was mad at somebody for no reason whatsoever. Now working on our anger is very difficult. Because it requires us to change our brain. It requires us to rewire our brain. Now the Baalei Musal say that there's only one way to do that. Learn Musar. Now, Rabbi Tzach Blazer, one of the key Talmidim of Rabbi Yisrael Misalant, said in the book, All Israel in the beginning, he says, in his day, it's almost 200 years ago, we have plenty of diseases, physical diseases, but Baruch Hashem, we have just as many medicines for them. Meaning, if you have a disease of some kind, we have some doctor or some pharmacist or somebody that has a cure for it. He says, there's only one disease that not only, not only there's no doctors, no one wants to be a doctor. And that's spiritual sickness. When people get angry, when people get depressed, when people have no emunah, when people have no yirat shamayim, people have all of these horrible spiritual diseases, no one wants to be a doctor. Why? Because there's only one medicine, and it's called musar. It's called teaching musar to the public. 
And the reason why is because when you teach people Musar, you're teaching them things that sometimes they already know, but they don't want to do. You're reminding them of what they know and they chose actively. They don't feel like fixing. Everyone knows anger is no good. Everyone knows being cheap is no good. Everyone knows that being arrogant is no good, but they still do it. Even if their wife or husband complain, everybody complains to such an extent that the Gemara says an arrogant person gets to such a point that even his family hates him and he stays arrogant. A greedy person gets to a point where Hashem made a specific halacha just for him. What's the halacha? Your body right now as a Jew is considered holy. Your body is 100% holy. Why? You make mitzvot. You make mitzvot, you make your body holy. You read from the Torah, you're holy. You fulfill a mitzvah, you're holy. But after somebody dies, Hashem Echem, after 120, the second they die, their body is what? Tameh. Why is the body Tameh, the Chachamim ask? Why did you go from holy to Tameh? Why did that happen? For what? He says because there's some people that are so greedy that if the body wasn't Tameh, if the body wasn't impure, the inheritance that the father leaves the, their kids wouldn't be enough. The house, the car, the, the building, the business, it wouldn't be enough. They'd also want to split the skin. And no, no, you got the house, I'm going to get a she- Abba's skin. I'm going to get his face. I'm going to get his leg. I'm going to get... That's how greed gets to a person's mind. So Hashem says, hey, the body, leave it alone. It's tame. It's not tame because it's really tame. It's tame because greed is such a big disease that if he didn't make it tame, you'd have family members fighting over a body. A person without musar is a person without a medicine to cure his illness. And the illness cannot go away like a headache. We discovered that Christianity is nonsense. It wasn't together. But she discovered that the oral Torah is a must be, so it's a prerequisite. She realizes something wrong with her equation. She continued looking. One day I discover a movie called Torah and Science by Rabbi Mizrahi. We watched part one together. Both of us were amazed. Then we watched, we wanted to watch part two, but it didn't work. So we watched part three. It's a three part movie, it's four hours. It's available for free on YouTube. It's called Torah and Science by Rabbi Yosef Mizrahi. It's amazing. Part two didn't work, so we skipped to part three. Part three was amazing. And then we, she said, listen, I'm very confused now. I know that Judaism is real. I know the Torah is real. I know that Christianity is nonsense, but still there's something there. I've been doing it my whole life. I need something. I need a sign. I need something. We knew for sure that what we had can't stay. But at the same token, we knew that neither one of us is leaving. So she did something insane that I would never approve of. But thank God she did it. That night, after we watched those two movies, those two parts, I went to sleep at some point, she went to pray, and she prayed to God and asked for something special. She said, God, he's not leaving. I'm not leaving, but neither one of us can stay together according to the conditions we have. So either give me a sign that you want me to convert to Judaism or just kill me instead. Now, it's interesting she actually did such a thing for a few reasons. Number one, you're not allowed to ask Hashem for signs. So ignorance was bliss. Ignorance was good for us because we're not allowed to ask Hashem for signs. You're not allowed to say, Hashem, if you say, do this, do that, then I'll do this. You're not allowed to give Hashem conditions. Can't say, Hashem, give me a uh, parking uh, spot right now and I'll uh, give my sale. <laughs> a guy did that one time. He said, Hashem, give me a parking spot because I have a meeting right now and I can make a million dollars and I'll, I'll give my sale. As soon as he finished the sentence, somebody pulled out. He said, oh, don't worry, Hashem, I took care of my own. (laughs) So she asked Hashem for something you're not allowed to ask for. The second reason, she was willing to give up a life for somebody that's not her. I wouldn't do it for anybody else. 
I don't think anybody else would do it. You could say you would do it, but in reality, when push comes to shove, most people wouldn't do it. She prayed, she got an answer. The Chachamim say that there's three levels of prayers. There's the prayer of Moshe Rabbeinu. There's the prayer of David HaMelech. Moshe Rabbeinu prayed 515 times to Hashem in Parashat Vayet Hanan. And we know that each one of his prayers is more significant than all of the prayers of all of Am Yisrael put together. We learn this after his sister Miriam got sick. Hashem gave a tzarat for saying Lashon Hara. All of Am Yisrael, millions of people prayed for her, nothing happened. No heal, no solution, no nothing. Aaron comes to Moshe and says, No, she's your sister, pray for her. He says five words, she gets cured. So the same Moshe Rabbeinu in Parashat Vayit Hanan prays 515 times to Hashem. says, Hashem, please let me go to Eretz Yisrael. Let me be me. Let me be a servant. Let me be a cow. Let me be a bird. Let me be anything. Let me just go in there. Hashem says, Rav Lach, enough, no more prayers from you. 515 prayers, no more. Why? If you do 516, I have to let you in. But I don't want to let you in. Why? Because Am Yisrael is going to sin a thousand years from now. And the Satan's going to come to me and says, they made such a sin called Avodah Zarah that it's such an extent you have to destroy all of them. Now, if you're the one that builds the Bet HaMikdash, we'd have a problem. Why? Because at that time, I'm going to tell Satan, listen, I know they made a sin, I know I have to destroy them, but I have something that is equal value. What is it? It's my house. I'll destroy my house instead of my people. Bet HaMikdash. But if you build the house, Moshe, I can't destroy it because everything you do, I've already decided is permanent. So I don't want you to pray 516 times because if you come into Eretz Am- to Israel, then Am Yisrael will be over in a thousand years from now. And I don't want to kill them. The second level of prayer is David HaMelech. David HaMelech prayed to Hashem endlessly to be the one that builds Bet HaMikdash. Hashem says, you can be the one that builds the foundation. And your son will build the rest of it, and your descendants will be the Mashiach. Hashem, when will I die? He says, I can't tell you. Can you at least tell me the day? He says, you're going to die on Shabbat. So every day on Shab- every Shabbat, David Melech would learn Torah non-stop. Because he knew that his learning Torah was so powerful that the Satan was scared of him when he learned Torah. Satan couldn't touch him. So one day, Satan tried to fool him by playing with the tree outside. So he didn't know what was happening. He says, well, what's happening? He goes outside, sees him, and for momentarily forgot. That he was learning Torah, got distracted, that's when Satan killed him. So the Chachamim asked, what does it mean? Every time he learns Torah, somebody makes a disturbance in the outside and he goes outside. What kind of learning Torah is that? Even if you're learning a math book, a history book, a science book, any book, somebody makes a noise outside, you go outside. Somebody beeps outside, you go outside. If you're focused, you don't go outside. So why did the Vina Melech, Kodesh Kodeshi, Mashiach comes from him, go outside, somebody made a, made a noise outside? Well, he wasn't focused? It was because he was focused. What he was focused on? The will of Hashem. He says, if somebody is playing on a tree on Shabbat, they're violating Shabbat. They're violating the word of Hashem. I have to go tell them. Why? Because if you violate the word of Hashem, Chayav Mita. Death penalty. So either I'm going to rebuke them and they're going to stop, or I'm going to rebuke them and I'm going to kill them. One of the two has to happen. I can't let it be. Why does the mitzvah in the Torah, one of the 613 mitzvot, called Ocheach Tochiach Et Amitecha? You must rebuke your brother. You see him driving on Shabbat, you must tell him. You're not allowed to drive on Shabbat. You see me not kosher, you have to tell him. You're not allowed to eat not kosher. You have to tell him. Why? Because the Gemara says, the oral Torah says, if you don't tell him, the sin goes to your account. You, can't, you thought you keeping Shabbat for 70, 80, 90 years, you go up to Shabbat and it's like, oh, here's Steve, the Mechalel Shabbat. We gave him a million dollars a year and he violated Shabbat. Steve says, no, I'm innocent. I kept Shabbat every year. What are you talking about? I kept Shabbat all the time. He goes, no, no. All your friends, they all violated Shabbat. You never told them one word. You never tried. You never said anything. You always said, oh, no, they got to do it on their own. Okay, they didn't do it on their own. You died. No one's going to tell them now. So Gemara says, you have to tell. It's a mitzvah in the Torah. So that's the second prayer, David the Melech. 
The third level of prayer is higher than Moshe Rabbeinu and also higher than David HaMelech. And that's the tefillah of Choser Oni, someone that's desperate. A poor man that's desperate. Why? His heart is completely broken. Hashem sometimes will want you to get to a completely desperate state because He wants your prayer. The reason why He gave Am Yisrael food every day instead of giving it to them once a year could have easily see Baruch Hashem I'm standing in front of you I'm not screaming I'm not yelling at least it's not part of the theatrics and we decided that we're going to take it seriously we got more and more religious we went to Israel we toured over there we continued to learn we came back we moved from New York to Florida to start a whole new life you can't really be Jewish on the 35th floor in New York we moved to Florida. We still had a little bit of money left, maybe about a half a million dollars left from all the millions we made. We figured, okay, we'll start a whole new life. I had a little bit of a hedge fund left. And I was making a few thousand dollars a month every month to survive. My money was in the market. I said, okay, we can be, we'll be fine. I was managing a small portfolio of clients and learning the rest of the day. Then my rabbi told me, okay, news. What's the news? You have to start doing a Shio Torah. I said, me? I don't know anything. He goes, exactly. Whatever you learn, tell them that. I said, but I don't know anything. He goes, exactly. So that's going to force you to learn. Learn and tell them that. He says, you have the ability to speak. Speak. So other people are not like you. They don't have to go through hell and back before they realize that Hashem's not joking. So okay, he's kind of right. So the first student was my mover. The guy that helped us move from New York to... Uh, <laughs> From New York to uh, Florida, he was helping us build the bed, and he heard some Jewish music. He said, oh, Jewish music. I'm like, oh, you like, you like Judaism? He goes, yeah, yeah, it's good. You like Torah. I'm like, you want to come for a shiur? He goes, who's going to come? I'm like, me and you. He's like, all right, fine. When? Tuesday night, 9 o'clock. All right, I'll be there. He came to my house, and I told him, listen, I'm going to tell you what God said. You do whatever you want. I'm not going to use my opinion. I'm just going to tell you what he said. And the reason why is because no one ever told me. The rabbis that came to my office every week never told me. They just asked me to give tzedakah. So I'm going to tell you, and I'm not going to ask you for anything. He's like, fine. 25, 30 minutes into it, I tell him, you're not allowed to drive on Shabbat. He goes, what do you mean I'm not allowed to drive on Shabbat? I'm like, you're not allowed to drive on Shabbat. He goes, yeah, but to shul, I'm okay, right? He goes, no, no, especially to shul, you're not allowed to drive. He says, what do you mean? I've been driving to shul on Shabbat for 22 years. No one ever told me anything. <laughs> I said, that's the problem. No one ever tells anybody anything anymore. It's up to you to learn. Newsflash, you're not allowed. He started keeping Shabbat. Baruch Hashem, he ended up keeping Shabbat, keeping more mitzvot, then he got married, he had a kid recently. Kosher kid, with a chupayin, chupayin kiddushin, everything. So I started seeing this works. Next week I had three students. Next week I had four students. Then five and then ten. And more people started showing up to my house. On Shabbat we'd have 15, 20 people. And we'd give shurim. And I became more and more interested in this and less and less interested in the business world. But still I needed to survive. But Hashem said, listen, you talk a lot about emunah. Emunah is easy to talk about. It's very easy. Everybody talks about it. It's a very, very popular subject. Nine out of ten lectures talk about emunah. But as soon as you, somebody tells you he has emunah and he gives you examples, you start thinking, oh, there's something weird about this guy. Like as soon as you find someone that has emunah, it's weird because it's not normal to have emunah. It's easy to talk about. It. Somebody tells you he lives off of nothing, that he completely depends on Hashem to provide panasah, you're like, oh yeah, it's like 3,000 years ago. What about today? Somebody says, no, no, it's, it's miracles. You survive off of miracles. It's like, yeah, no, really, what's the real story? How do you really survive? So Hashem says, okay, I perform miracles for you. I have to do another one. This one's going to be a little more difficult. He says, I want you to focus on doing lectures all the time and kiruv all the time. And the reason why is because I have a lot of businessmen like you. I just don't have a lot of Jews, though. I need more Jews. So since you're getting some people to become Jews again, I need you to focus on that. So that half a million dollars, you know that half a million dollars that I had left from the millions and millions and millions and millions and millions? He took that too. 
one day I wake up 9 30 in the morning Eastern time the market opens I got a few million that I'm managing for clients I got the half a million that's part of the portfolio that's my money it used to be much much more at 9 35 it's all worth zero something went wrong something went this long story short I'll save you the time it's worth BDU zero at 9 36 I shut off the computer I say Hashem Natan Hashem Lakach Yi Shem Hashem Evorach which I learned from Job he told his wife after Hashem took all his money he said God gave God took may his name be blessed it's his anyway right he took it I have a shield to get ready for in a few hours I shut off the computer, I get ready for my shield Torah. Until this day, the people that attended that shield didn't know that I lost all my money that day. But the reality is, from that moment on, I realized that Hashem wants me to do this, what I'm doing right now in front of you. So we focused on that. We started an organization called Bezat Hashem. That's the same organization that you see the name on all the posters over there for Hashem Yitzah that we give out everywhere. Different people all over the world get these Hashem Yitzah, they put them outside of their bathroom, and they say the blessing. Why? You should th- thank Hashem that your body works. I know what it feels like when it doesn't. Then you have the CDs. There's almost 80 hours worth of shiulet Torah on those CDs. Some people don't have a CD player in their car, so they just use a CD as a flyer to go to my website. And there is over a thousand hours worth of Torah there. Another th- of mine. Another thousand or 1,500 hours worth of Torah from Rav Ephraim. The one that's been here the whole way. And Baruch Hashem, we've been doing shiurim day and night, everywhere we can, to get Am Yisrael to come back. Baruch Hashem, over the last several years, we've had many people do tshuva, many people convert from Christianity to Judaism, many people come back from Christianity. They were already Jews, but they converted to Christianity. We got them to come back home after we realized they realized what kind of shtuyot, what kind of nonsense they're dealing with. And we had many Jews come back home, Jews that didn't know right or left. Now when people ask me, what do you really need to do this? Now the typical answer people would tell you is money. It's not true. Yes, money is needed, but it's not really the necessary thing. The main thing you need is people that care. That's it. You just need people with a heart. Because Kiruv is something you could do for free. Just share the message. Take this lecture, it's going to be online tomorrow. Share it with your friends, share it with your children, share it with people. That's it. You have money, you could donate, good. All this stuff costs money. You don't, it doesn't make a difference. You can still help without a single dollar. We need millions, but we don't need it from you. We need it from everyone. You don't have to give it. All you have to do is take this lecture and share it with people. You can do Q for free. What's in it for you? The prophet Jeremiah says that Hashem Ibarach told him, if you bring a precious one from a sluggard you'll be like my mouth if you bring someone they used to be mechalel shabbat you make him precious again you make him a jew again you make him keep shabbat again you'll be like my mouth so the chachamim ask what does it mean to be like hashem's mouth hashem says i created the world with words you can too you pray i do even to the extent where I decree that someone will die, but you don't want them to, if you help people do tshuva, I'll stop it just for you. I've seen it many times. And I'll finish with one example, and then you guys could ask as many questions you want, unless you want to go to sleep. One, question, one story is, the one guy said to me, my two-year-old kid had something in his head, Hashem Rechem. What do I do? I said, do kiruv. He said, no, no, but what do I do for my kid? Do I pray? I said, yeah, do Kiruv. Do Kiruv. He goes, okay, fine. He donated $1,000 for the CDs. Now, he didn't really think much. He went and continued praying. A few days later, he calls me, and he says, you're never going to believe it. I said, what? He says, I, my wife took my son to get the final check before the surgery for... What he has in his head. Shem Rechem, two years old, can have a surgery. I said, okay, so what did the doctor say? Well, he said, where's the kid? 
and my wife said he's here he's right here he goes no no where's the kid with the problem because this kid doesn't have anything he goes so it kind of works doesn't it I said yeah Hashem's serious there's a lot of people in the world that are businessmen some of them even have Jewish mothers but there's very few Jews to be a Jew Rabotai, you have to keep Shabbat to be a Jew you have to keep kosher to be a Jew you have to keep Hashem's opinion not yours Sometimes our opinions agree and sometimes they don't. We still have to pick his. Now there's two choices, the Rambam says. You can either do tshuva from shulim like this that are easy and painless, unless you were pained by my speech, or you can wait for other things. The key of the speech, the reason why I do kiruv is because I'm afraid that some people are going to choose the second. They're going to wait for Hashem to talk to them. When Hashem talks, it hurts. So... Bezat Hashem, this will give us all chizuk for ourselves, for our children, for our friends, for our family, for our neighbors, for everyone we know and everyone we don't know. When you do kiruv, don't do accounting. Just give them the information. There's extra CDs, more than there is people here. Give them out. Give them to people. There's the personal stories in there along with many other things. Give them to people. You never know. Maybe one of these people has been looking for an answer their whole life and finally it's in there. Even if they throw it in the garbage, still they're one step closer to tshuva. Sometimes you have to get to a point of desperation. Maybe you're going to help them get to the answer. Maybe you're going to help them get to the point of desperation. Either way, do something. All we need is people that care. The rest of it, Hashem provides anyway. Any questions? Yeah. So when you talk about the 15 days of darkness, okay. so if we'll go back to Egypt, it was three days. Yeah, the ones that are righteous will see. The ones that are righteous have nothing to worry about. The ones that are wicked have everything to worry about. If somebody does tshuva, everything will be good. If somebody doesn't do tshuva, they should pray for the Mashiach not to come. That's the truth. If you're working on it every single day. If you're working on it every single day, then you know that you're going in the right direction. If you're coasting, if everything is clear and everything is good, that means that something's missing. Because tshuva is not a one-step process. Tshuva is much more difficult than the most difficult career on the planet. Whatever career you had in your life, whatever job you had, tshuva is even more difficult. Because tshuva is not just keeping Shabbat. There's plenty of robots that keep Shabbat. You still there's other things. So tshuva has to do with the mitzvot. You have Shabbat, you have Koshi, you have Talat Mishpacha, you have all the mitzvot that are logical, you have Sukkot, Pesach, and so on. But then after that, you have to work on yourself. Meaning the Torah's main objective is to perfect you as a human being. Meaning you have to perfect all of the negative character traits you have one at a time. So if somebody is naturally an a angry little gremlin like I, like I was, then they have to work on their anger. They have to realize that when they're angry, it's not only making Hashem upset, it makes Hashem hate them because it's a form of idolatry. The example is that in the Gemara Masechet Avodah Zarah, it says that Avraham Avinu had 400 chapters for his tractate of Avodah Zarah. Like we have uh, Avodah Zarah tractate, it has five chapters. Avraham Avinu had 400 chapters. So Chachamim asked, what could, why did he have so, so much more? says that the other 395 extra were forms of anger that a person would have and how to fix it. Point being, Rabotai, is that the mitzvot are there for us to perfect ourselves. If someone is stingy, they have to work on it. If someone is arrogant, they have to work on it. If someone is there, each negative character trait, they have to work on it. This book, for example, which I was hoping to go over, but, you know, we lost time. This book is very, very book by, uh, it's called Remove Anger from Your Heart by Rav Avram Tubuleski. Um, it's um, this particular one is one of a series it was translated to English it's English and Hebrew this is specifically about anger anyone that has the same issue like I've had most of my life as far as anger this is a phenomenal book to read but it's not one of those it's not a novel that you just read it one time and you finish this is one of those things that you meditate on you start thinking about it what is it really the meaning behind this and so on and so forth Musar you'll see that the first hundred pages of this book is different quotes from different sages throughout history that tell you how critical it is for you to learn Musar every day. Not passively, 
not once in a blue moon, but every single day. And some of them say it should be at least two hours a day. Alvai people would learn two minutes a day because really people don't learn. So Musar is something critical, and that's the way that you're going to perfect yourself as a human being. If you're learning Musar every day, it's a matter of time before your tshuva you know, is perfected. But over time, you'll see that as you learn more and more, you have to do more and more. In the beginning, it's just Shabbat, or Ta'at Mishpachai, and then later on, you start seeing, oh, wait a minute, I have to work on this, I have to work on this. And most people that think that they have good character traits, like, for example, being grateful, once you learn Musar, you realize that most people don't even know what being grateful is. And I'll give you an example. If, let's say, for example, somebody, you wanted to write something new, you wanted to write a new idea, and you didn't have a pen, and somebody... You want somebody had a pen, you ask them for a pen. Now what do you say? Thank you. Now why are you saying thank you? Provide you with a pen. That's it, right? Just a pen. The reality is, that doing that, if you really delve into it, is being ungrateful. Saying thank you for the pen only is actually ungrateful. Why? Because he didn't bring you just a pen. The only reason you were able to write the entire idea is because of the pen. Now, once you start thinking about it, that idea is going to be transferred somewhere else. You're going to benefit out of that idea. It could be the next business idea. It could be the next uh, Torah thought. You could write a whole book because of this idea. The person that gave you a pen technically is a partner in all of it. So we only said thank you for the pen because rationally, that's what we got. In reality, we got a partner. He's a partner in everything that comes out of it. So when we say thank you, we're saying for thank you for something that's very, very simple that we just got. We're not realizing the totsaot, the outcome of what we got. When your parents, you say thank you to your parents for bringing me life, you're not realizing, wait a minute, if I didn't have life, I wouldn't have a wife, I wouldn't have a husband, I wouldn't have kids, I wouldn't have fun, I wouldn't have a good time, I wouldn't have a purpose in life. You're thinking thank you very much for being together one day 30 years ago, 80 years ago, and I'm here in the world. In reality, you survived every single day because they care that you're going to survive. They gave you food, they gave you air, all the different things. So when we say thank you, using our rationale, really we're ungrateful. Only way you're going to get to the deeper root of everything, whether it's gratitude or anything else, is by learning it, by learning to Musar. So, tshuva has to do with all of that. Yeah? Uh, you touched up on uh, depression a little bit. Okay. Uh, how can we help a secular Jew with fighting depression? Do tshuva. That's the only way, because depression, which I suffered from from most of my life, um, is not a, um, it's not something that's based on physical, even though most people think that they're suffering because they lost money, or they lost a wife, or they lost a husband, or something like that. Feelings, love, and uh, all other feelings are something spiritual. So when someone tries to fix a, spir- a spiritual flaw with something material, with something physical, it's like putting a bandage on a heart attack. You know, even if it works by some fluke, it's only temporary. So the only way to fix something spiritual is with something spiritual. And the only thing that's pure spiritually is the Torah. So if you can get them to see that their real problem is that they're disconnected to the source. They're disconnected to the power outlet that's called God. They're disconnected from him. They're disconnected from a purpose. They have no point in their life. Their whole point was money. And as soon as they lost money, there's no point to life. But the reality is that everybody knows that it's, a, uh, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not the point of life. There's plenty of people that are happy without it. There's plenty of people that are depressed with it. So the reality is that a per- person cannot do a, uh, cannot get out of depression on a longer term basis uh, purely by themselves. It has to be with Torah. That's why you'll see, for example, many celebrities, many really successful people, you know, with all the money in the world, with family, with kids, with all the material stuff you could possibly imagine, still commit suicide. You know, whether it's the, uh, the comedian that killed himself, I don't know, a year or two ago, uh, um, uh, Robin Williams, or many other like him. I mean, these people had all the material in the world, including wife and kids and friends and fame and fortune and whatever you want. They had all of it, and it was still meaningless. So that's because inside, the neshama knows it needs something else, and when a person just simply is not providing it, there's no answer for him. So the question is, what is it better off to be, a depressed poor person or a depressed rich person? 
<laughs> and the answer actually is a depressed poor person. And the reason why is because a depressed poor person always has hope that if he gets rich, he'll get out of his depression. Evel Avalim, Secha. It's all nothing. It's all nothing. Exactly. But that's the thing. Someone that doesn't know that, doesn't know God, doesn't know anything. He thinks that if he's going to get money, he's going to get out of his depression. The guy that already has anything, he has no hope. So that's the thing. So really the most important thing, most important message you need to deliver people, uh, to people is that you should ask yourself, why are you in this world? What, what's the point? Okay, so money, okay, you had money, you lost money, then what? Kids, okay, you had kids, they moved on, then what? Wife, you had wife, husband, you had, okay, then what? You have to ask yourself constantly, then what's the point? And that's the thing, people that don't ask themselves what's the point, they get into depression. Because they realize, they start thinking that there's no point. The person is depressed because sick parents. Sick parents? Okay, so if, you know, again, it's very difficult to deal with sickness personally, and sometimes even more difficult to deal with it when someone else you love is, uh, is going through it. But if you know where it's coming from, it has meaning. Torah doesn't solve all your problems. Anyone that tells you that if you start doing tshuva, everything will be fixed is lying to you. That's not the way Torah works. That's not the way Hashem works. Hashem is not our servant. He's not Santa Claus. Like people try to portray Hashem like He's going to give you everything you want. And this. It's not true. Hashem is not your servant. Hashem said He's the king. We're the servant. Now, the reward, the real reward is after this world. It's not here. So anytime somebody gets any form of reward here, the Rambam explains that it's not really for you here. It's for you because you did something good. He gives you the ability to do more good. So if you gave Staka, he's going to give you more money. Not because he wants you to have more money, but because he wants you to have the ability to make more mitzvot and give more money. If you had a wife, so he's going to give you the ability to have kids now. Why? Because you got married, so he's gonna, you did one mitzvah, he's going to give you the ability to do another mitzvah. Now, the thing is, though, is that if a person thinks that if they do tshuva, everything's going to be fixed, they're misled completely. And the reason why is because you see it throughout history, is that even though in the beginning, sometimes you'll see a lot of miracles, a lot of wonderful things, at some point, the training wheels come off. Just like your kid, in the beginning you have training wheels on a bicycle, and she thinks she's riding the bicycle great and everything good, and then you take off the training wheels, and she falls off. But you still keep him off. Why? Because she has to learn how to start riding the bike normally. Same thing with Hashem. In the beginning, he has training wheels. He helps you a lot. Gives you special miracles, special things. Eventually, he starts taking off the training wheels because you have to learn how to cope. And the reason why is because he's training you for the bigger tests. Because the bigger tests are necessary in order for you to be the best version of you. The best version of you is not going to happen by itself. You're not going to become, for example, if you're working out in a gym, you're not going to become a bodybuilder lifting five pounds like when you started. Over time, you have to lift more. Five, then 10, then 50, then 100, then a house, then two houses, whatever you have to build. But eventually, you have to lift more. Why? Because you have to put more pressure in order to become stronger. Same thing with life. In order to become a better version of you, a softer, a softer body and a stronger neshama, you have to go through more difficulty and more tests. And that emunah test is necessary. It's a necessary part of tshuva. So when people are selling Judaism like it's a product in the store where if you do it, everything will be fixed, it's only bound to fail. Many people start doing tshuva, they see difficulty and they abandon everything. And that's because they were sold a bag of goods that's wrong. Judaism is not necessarily going to fix your problems. But what will it do? What will the Torah do? It will give you a reason. It will give you a reason for all the problems. It will give you a purpose. That's more valuable. So we'll finish up because I know some of you want to go. It's late tonight, but I'll give you one story and then you can go home. And anyone that wants to ask questions, you can ask after. I don't want anyone to feel uncomfortable not leaving or anything. So I'll give you one story. Rabbi Akiva married Rachel. Rachel was young, beautiful, and a daughter of the richest man of the land, Kalba Savua. Now Kalba Savua didn't like that they got married, because Rabbi Akiva was ignorant, didn't know any Torah, and he was broke. So, didn't have anything going for him. But he had good midot. Rachel, the 18-year-old, saw this 40-year-old with good midot, good character traits. She goes, he's a good one for me. 
So Kalba Savua cut her off from the inheritance, cut her off from everything. They became dead broke. All they had was straw. Now, one day they had a baby, a little baby girl, and they had enough just to put, uh, you know, put the baby with the straw. Didn't have a house, didn't have a bed, didn't have anything. And Rachel got really upset. She was, you know, she used to have beds of gold. She used to have a castle. She used to have everything. Now her baby little girl, a little princess, doesn't even have a bed. All she has is a straw. She felt bad for herself. So Hashem saw that they have pure hearts. And the reason why she did all this is for him. The reason why she just to fulfill his will, to learn to lie and so on. So he sent her Eliyahu and Avi. So Eliyahu and Avi came as a broke person, as a homeless person. And he said to her, excuse me, excuse me, please, please. So they said, oh wow, somebody knows us. Yeah, how can I help you? How can I help you? He says, listen, we just had a girl and we had a baby and we don't have anything for her. Do you have some straw maybe? Maybe you have some straw to help us make a bed for her? So Rabbi Akiva says, yeah, of course, straw we have. He started, he started getting some straw, got a sack of straw, gave him the straw, and he comes to the Rachel, he says, look how rich we are, we have straw. Some people don't even have straw. So the Chachamim asks, wait a minute, if you're already sending Eliyahu and Avi, why can't Eliyahu and Avi show up with a check for a million bucks? <laughs> why can't Eliyahu and Avi show up with some cash, some diamonds, some jewels, some stuff? What do you think? Yeah, straw. For what? He says, because Hashem is not trying to solve your problem one time. He's trying to solve your problem permanently. If he gave Rabbi Akiva and Rachel the million dollars, it would have only solved the problem temporarily. Because the problem was not the money. The problem is that we're not happy with our share. And as it was, who's rich? Someone that's happy with a share. Once you know that the straw is a lot, because somebody else doesn't have straw, it's already like you have a billion dollars. The problem is that most of us don't realize that we have a billion dollars. We want the other guy's straw. So there's other saying this helps us do tshuva and gets us all strong. Anyone that has any questions, you can always contact me on uh, text, emails, uh, and so on. My uh, information is in the CDs. Amen.